In a previous episode of the Discover the Word podcast, Bill Crowder led the group in a study called Amazing Moments in the Gospel of Mark. Nine times in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus says or does something and it says the crowd was amazed Mm. or the individual he was dealing with was amazed. And that is how he described the premise of that study back in uh, late November, early December of 2023. Well, that was such a memorable study that he put together a sequel that we'll embark on in this episode. For this set of conversations, we're going to do a similar thing only in the Gospel of Luke. I think we have lost something of a sense of wonder. We've become so accustomed, so familiar with the stories in the Bible, especially the stories about Jesus. It's kind of like, oh yeah, he healed a leper. (laughs) You know, and it's kind of like, (laughs) then we just kind of keep going like, no big deal. Well, it was a huge deal and Mm -hmm. it was an amazing deal. And I'd like for us to kind of try to get inside the skin of these amazed people, and maybe it'll kind of help awaken some of that wonder for us. Mm -hmm. Love it. Amazing moments in Luke on this Discover the Word podcast. And welcome to Discover the Word, the small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries. Our Daily Bread Ministries is a Bible engagement ministry inviting you to engage the scriptures in a number of different ways that can shape your relationship with God. And as I said, Discover the Word is structured a lot like a small group Bible study. And so your study partners for this look at amazing moments in the Gospel of Luke are Bill Crowder, Elisa Morgan, Daniel Ryan Day, and Rasul Berry. And I remember that look at amazing moments in Mark being really helpful. And so I'm glad Bill put together this follow-up in Luke. And if you miss those conversations on Mark, you will find them on our discovertheword.org website. Click on the archive tab up at the top of the page and then type the keywords amazing moments in the search bar. It will give you access to that study from back in November of 2023. Okay, so let's get started as Bill comes close to sending the group back to the website to remind them of what they talked about not really all that long ago. Okay, so a while back, we did a series of conversations on amazing moments in Mark. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was that kind of about? Amazing moments in Mark. Good. That's that's (laughs) well stated. I think there were places in Mark that were pretty amazing, and that's what we talked about. (laughs) Yeah. Or getting closer. (laughs) I was amazed. There were times that that the word amazing was used in Mark that we brought some attention to. Closer. Now we're actually getting into the general... (laughs) time zone uh, of uh, what it was, was there are like nine or 10 specific moments in the gospel of Mark where Jesus says or does something. And Mark says, and the people were amazed. Yeah. And as we did that, Bill, I remember afterwards, uh, back at home, I was still reading in Mark and I found more and that whole series really popped that word for me. I started seeing it everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And and I did too. And that's why for this set of conversations, we're going to do a similar thing only in the Gospel of Luke. Now, you'll probably be relieved to know that there are only five of them (laughs) in Luke. So one of the things that I think is going to make this different is that in the amazing moments in Mark, one of the things that we focused on was the event itself and what Jesus did or said. I think I want us to focus a little more this time on the people who are described as being amazed. Because what we're going to see is... You know how you throw a rock into a pool of water and you get the spreading ripples? Yeah, I think we're going to see that starting with those closest to Jesus and rippling out to people who really didn't have a up-close personal (laughs) connection with him, but were nevertheless amazed by what he did. So this time around, let's focus on the people who are amazed, and we'll focus on the amazing stuff too, but I want us to try to connect where we are with them because I think— we have lost something of a sense of wonder. We've become so accustomed, so familiar with the stories in the Bible, especially the stories about Jesus. It's kind of like, oh yeah, he healed a leper. Eh, you know, And it's kind of like, <laughs> then we just kind of keep going like, no big deal. Well, it was a huge deal and mm-hmm. it was an amazing deal. And I'd like for us to kind of try to get inside the skin 
of these amazed people, and maybe it'll kind of help awaken some of that wonder for us. Mm -hmm. Love it. Mm -hmm. it. Sounds good, especially because I think sometimes why that happens is we're so removed from those moments mm -hmm. historically, and it's hard to be amazed sometimes by the things that we didn't personally see or we're just yeah. reading about or whatever. And so maybe if we get into the characters a little bit more and maybe it'll be a little more mm. yeah, real to us. I think you're right, Daniel. And I think the, the distance that 2,000 years creates is part of it. I think some of it too speaks into the Christian culture today. We've talked about this on the program before, but the Christian community here in the West is so informationally oriented that we take those truly wonder-inspiring things and just turn them into data points mm -hmm. instead of letting them fill our hearts with awe as to who Jesus really is and not only what he did, but what he still does today. So let's start, and we're going to start, interestingly enough, in the back part of Luke's birth narrative of Jesus. We're going to Luke chapter 2. Uh, I want you to pick up with verse 22. And Daniel, if you read through 24, and then Rasul pick up 25 to 27, and Elisa 28 to 32, okay. that'll get us started. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And I'm guessing this is Mary and Joseph bringing Jesus. Correct. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him according to the custom of the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory of your people, Israel. Okay. Now, verse 33 is the punchline. And his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. Now, does that surprise you any, that they would be amazed? It does. Mm -hmm. I mean, even though we know that angels appeared to Mary and Joseph already, I mean, to hear a man, I just am, you know, this widely regarded, righteous, devout person saying, now I'm good to die, mm -hmm. Lord, because I have seen with my eyes your salvation. That's still, I would think, a weighty thing for someone to hear when they're bringing a the baby into the temple. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, really, the last nine plus months for them, mm -hmm. somewhere in there, have just been a series of crazy, amazing moments. And I wonder if Luke's just helping us remember that, like, yeah, they haven't gotten used to that yet, mm -hmm. right? It's still pretty amazing what they're seeing. And mm -hmm. just like Rasul said, to hear these particular words spoken about mm -hmm. your son, even knowing everything else that's gone on, that still had to be a moment of awe for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you think about, as you said, Rasul, they were visited by angels. They heard angelic messengers, which all by itself. That's is, enough. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that'll amazing. do, right? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, but then the visit of the shepherds mm -hmm. and their encounter with angelic messengers. And now they come to the temple and it doesn't stop. It keeps going. Now, this... If I recall correctly, this rite of purification usually came like 40 days after childbirth. So it's been a month and a half or so since the shepherds came and visited him. So maybe they've had a quiet few days and all the ruckus has kind of calmed down. And now all of a sudden here they are at the temple. And this dude comes out of the corner of the temple, grabs the baby from their arms mm -hmm. and starts saying these amazing words. I mean... I think you're right, Daniel. I think it'd be easy for us to lose sight 
of what that would have been like for Mary and Joseph. And so maybe Luke just kind of wants to remind us, yeah, Jesus is the son of God, but Mary and Joseph are, are human people <laughs> and they're trying to process all this stuff. I mean, it says earlier in Luke after the shepherds that Mary kept all these things and what? Treasure them in her heart. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, she's processing. She's trying to sort all this stuff out. And now they come to this and they are amazed. Yeah. My translation says marveled, which is a yeah. fascinating word as well. But I have no idea what was going through their minds. You know, did they expect for Jesus to be born and immediately he would be king? Or did they expect him to grow up and then become? You know, we don't know. We have no mm. idea. So were they watching behind every pillar for somebody who was going to bow down and worship him? Or was that a stunning surprise? Obviously, it was a stunning surprise you know, because of the word amazed. Yeah. But it, I just can't even put myself in their sandals to understand what this yeah. must have felt like. Daniel, pick up and read for us verses 34 and 35 because they're amazed but Simeon keeps talking Mm -hmm. and we need to catch this part of what he says as well then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary this child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too Mm. yeah that last part is part of the Christmas story I think about at Easter Yes, you know it's haunting, isn't it? Yeah, mm-hmm. the the thing I want you to notice, if they were amazed at what he said before, they've got to really be amazed now because he says this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel. The word rise is the word for resurrection, mm-hmm. and what we know is that mm-hmm. through Jesus's resurrection we will rise again, and so obviously that not only is for us as Gentiles but also for Jews who put their faith in Jesus, he was for the rise of many. Now, what do you think the fall of many was talking about? I think about those who he opposed most significantly, especially corrupt religious leaders, some Mm -hmm. of those in the sect of the Pharisees who found themselves wanting to cling to their own power and influence more than the truth. Of course, you had others that weren't in that space, but yeah, there was a fall. Yeah. One commentator said that just by his coming to the earth, he was going to force people to a point of decision. Mm -hmm. And some would choose to follow him and would eventually experience resurrection. Others would reject him and would experience collapse. Mm -hmm. And again, Jesus still today is the most pivotal human that's ever been born partly because he was more than human, but he was not less than human. It makes me think about the references to him being a stumbling stone yeah. in that way. You know, his very presence makes us trip up and re-examine and fall yeah. and, you know, say, who are we going to be loyal to? Yeah, yeah I think about the rich young ruler, mm. you know, mm. point of decision. Yeah, mm-hmm. Judas Iscariot, point of decision. Sure. So but, many of them. Yes. Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate. Herod. Mm -hmm. And yet on the flip side, you see John the Baptist, you see Peter, you see John, you see Mary Magdalene, points of decision that they were amazed. And as a result of that amazement, they followed him for the rest of their lives. Yeah. And even some of those point of decision people, we don't know ultimately what happened to some of them, like the rich young ruler. Yeah. He goes away sad at the beginning, but then what happens later? Mm -hmm. Does he recognize, wow, that... I did stumble over what Jesus said and fell, but then through thinking about that for the next few years of his life or after seeing what happened to Jesus on the cross or whatever, we don't know if at some point he had a very different change of heart Mm -hmm. and experienced the rising just as much Mm -hmm. as he had experienced the falling. It's a great point. Mm -hmm. So Mary and Joseph had had their moment of decision earlier when they had the angelic visitors. Mary responded to the moment of decision by submission Joseph with obedience. I mean, I think even though in the biblical record, Joseph never speaks, which I'm fascinated mm. by that. that. He so never speaks. Mm-hmm. But every time something happens, like even them coming for the rites of purification, that's Joseph being obedient mm-hmm. all along the way. And I think they understand this moment of decision and they've already made their decision, mm-hmm. even though they can't even at this point yet begin to understand all the ramifications of what that decision is going to mean. Yeah, 
amazing moments in Luke. We're going to spend this episode looking at them. Times when Jesus did or said something that people reacted to with amazement. And however they expressed it, you know, mouth open, eyes wide, head shaking, whatever that looked like, these were amazing moments. And as Bill said, we'll be focusing on the people who were amazed as part of this. And I think that will help us identify with their reactions and decisions that they had to make after seeing or hearing what they did. And our hope is that having these conversations will restore some of the awe and wonder of these events and also help us recognize ways that God is still doing amazing things today. Well, the next amazing moment in Luke takes place in Jesus' hometown of Nazareth, where at one point the people had nothing but good to say about their native son, Jesus. They were amazed by his gracious words. But then, kind of a shocking reversal, and I mean shocking, and I mean reversal. Let's listen to part two of this study of amazing moments in Luke. Okay, we're going to look in Luke chapter 4 for this conversation, but I want us to start with a verse out of Matthew 13. Elisa, would you read Matthew 13, 57? Okay. And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town and in his own home. Okay. Have you ever experienced that? Yes. <laughs> but not like Jesus. No, but <laughs> Just I mean, to be clear. <laughs> but share some of what that feels like. I remember... Um, I had dated a guy for like six years in high school and college, and we broke up. It was very clear that the Lord was guiding us in different directions. And I was trying to figure out what to do with my life and really discerning God's call on my life. And I, I felt this nudge to go to seminary. And I remember reporting that to my father. He goes, oh, oh, Lisa, there are a lot other guys out there. You don't have to become a nun. <laughs> it wasn't dishonoring, but it was like totally didn't get me. Yeah. Well, that's pretty uncomfortable coming from your dad, right? <laughs> yeah, somebody like who, when I first started following Jesus, was the only person I knew in my family that was on that path that clearly and directly. My brother at the time, older brother, you know, we already had a sometimes contentious relationship. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, him just making joke, making light of my faith and it was really mm -hmm. you know pushing my buttons but you know he's my older brother so I would <laughs> really I would buy into it fortunately we're in a different place now but yeah I remember just feeling like why don't they get me at home totally I don't know that I can relate to Jesus words there's a rootedness that Jesus experienced in his hometown that is rare for any of us to ever really experience he was known by all the neighbors so well and all the people so well mm -hmm. and small village life and all of that. Mm -hmm. And I just have never experienced that type of rootedness. Mm. For me, I was born in Virginia, grew up in West Virginia from the second grade through high school in mm. West Virginia. And then I got a job in West Virginia and worked for a few years before I went away to Bible college. And so four years later, I graduate and, um, went on the faculty and taught for three years. And then after that three years, some families in my hometown, including my parents, asked if I would help them start a church. And uh, so we ended up being there for eight years. Oh, gosh. Um, and it was a great experience, except when Marlene and I would be at the grocery store and we would run into the mom of some girl I dated in high school. And, uh, yeah, this is my wife. Oh, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and what are you doing now? Well, I'm a pastor of a church here. What? Gosh. You're what? I'm a pastor of a church here in town. Not possible. <laughs> well, you can come Sunday and find out. I mean, you know, <laughs> we'd love to have you, you know, but you know, you have those kind of things and there is this sense, isn't there, that because your path was different from what people expected or thought it should be, there's that sense of devaluing that mm. you get from that. Mm. And then that there is a saying, familiarity breeds contempt. Mm -hmm. Sure. So Absolutely. there's something about, we know you. We yeah. know everything about you. And, yeah. and that's not really true, but people perceive it to be yeah. true. So as a result of that, you know, there's a sense of, uh, been there, done that. Yeah, right? and that's kind of that rootedness Daniel was talking mm -hmm. about, right. and especially in small towns growing up. So let's look at Luke chapter 4. What was Jesus' hometown? I mean, his birthplace was Bethlehem, but what was his hometown? 
Nazareth. Okay, so mm-hmm. we're going to start in Nazareth. So, Elise, if you'll read verses 16 and 17, and Daniel, if you'll read 18 and 19, and then Rasul, if you'll get 20 through 22, that'll get us where we need to be for this one. Okay. Okay. Luke four sixteen. he, yep. Jesus, went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. Key phrase. That's not just a throwaway phrase. That's a, a reminder. So we have our bearings, mm-hmm. both geographically and emotionally. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. Another key phrase. Yeah, Go yeah. ahead. He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. Then he began to speak to them. The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Everyone spoke well of him and was amazed by the gracious words that came from his lips. How can this be? They asked. Isn't this Joseph's son? No. (laughs) No. Uh, It's amazing to go back to what you said, Rasul, how people say, oh, yeah, I know everything about them. No, they don't know everything about him. Jesus finds this particular place in Isaiah that he wants to read from. He reads it, tells them essentially that he's the fulfillment of that. And it says they had two responses. It says they were speaking well of him Uh and they were amazed by the gracious words that he said. They spoke well of him, but but we've read this text before. We know what happens next, don't we? Yeah. Verse 28, when they heard this, what Mm. Jesus talks about afterwards, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town and led him to the brow of a hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. We'll talk about the dots that might connect that stuff together. But for right now, as you hear verse 22, all were speaking well of him and amazed at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? That's that familiarity thing. Mm -hmm. Familiarity has bred contempt for them because who's he think he is? He's a carpenter's son. But at Mm -hmm. the same time, they were speaking well of him. Now, what about the contrast in those two things? I do feel like it's, a bit of a, should we really take what he's saying to heart to this much because we know who he is and he's a carpenter's son? Yeah. It's not likely that Jesus would have had much formal education. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, we get that uh, even later in the Gospels as the fishermen from Galilee or in Jerusalem and they're preaching the gospel, they say, these are unlearned, untrained men. I mean, it's possible very simply that they were amazed by the fact he could read Mm -hmm. because that was not common. I mean, literacy was not all that common in in the ancient world or in ancient Israel. The fact that he could read may have in itself been a point of amazement to some of them because they did know his background. And he's also a tradesman. Yeah. And he's stepping out of a role where we know he's good at shaping stone and wood and building things, right? That's what we expect of him. He grew up learning that from Joseph. That was Joseph's trade. Yeah. So he knows that trade well. And then to step out of that role and to be teaching in the synagogue and then making a proclamation that's very messianic about what's getting ready to happen culturally and all of that, it just feels very out of character at this point for them to see Jesus doing that, even though we know where the story's going. It's It's very much character for Jesus. It's very much in character for their expectations expectations of what they would expect. Now we said we'd touch on it. We have just a little bit of time to do it, but the bridge that connects the, they spoke well of him to the, we want to throw him off the cliff and kill him is Jesus says to them in what, in their understanding, would have been a statement against Israel. He says to them, Truly, I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. Well, that's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. 
And he says, I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months when a great famine came over all the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet. None of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. What he's doing is... He's reaching outside of Israel in the first indication of how big his message is really going to be. That's offensive. But you know why? Because as Simeon said, he was given for the rise and fall of many. And this confrontational statement puts them at a point of decision. Mm. Are they going to respond to him and to his message? Or are they going to stay in their cocoon and trust in the wrong things? That point of decision idea is going to come up again several times in this episode. How people responded to these amazing moments and how we respond is a key piece of this study of amazing moments in Luke. And it's pretty obvious that the way those hometown Nazareth folk went from positive amazement to, well, wanting to throw Jesus off a cliff, that's a pretty drastic swing of response. Well, you're listening to Discover the Word with Bill Crowder. Daniel Ryan Day, Elisa Morgan, and Rasul Berry. And we will continue this study in just a moment. Now, Discover the Word is an aspect of the larger Bible engagement organization, Our Daily Bread Ministries. In a variety of ways, we're committed to our mission of telling the story of Jesus and making the life-changing story and wisdom of the Bible understandable and accessible to people all around the world. And as a friend of Discover the Word and Our Daily Red Ministries, uh, you help us do that. We are a user-supported ministry, and so if you'd like to learn more about becoming a financial partner with us, visit our website by typing discovertheword.org into your web browser, and then clicking the Donate button at the top of the page. But giving financial support is not the only way that you can support us here at Discover the Word. Supporting the show can be as simple as sharing this or previous episodes with family or friends who you think would enjoy studying the Bible with us. And that's why we believe it is so important that listeners have access to Discover the Word, both past and present, 24-7. When you visit our website at discovertheword.org, you may have noticed a little button labeled Archive up at the top of the screen. Go ahead and click on that. And that'll take you to a search page where you can start exploring all of the different topics and passages that we've covered over the years. Thousands of conversations, hundreds of topics and passages. So explore our archive and encourage others to do so as well at discovertheword.org. Well, as we continue this study of amazing moments in Luke, Bill and Daniel and Rasul and Elisa discuss some of the most amazing things they've seen in their own lives. And I'm pretty sure we all have those amazing moments stories that we can tell. Jesus' disciples had plenty of them. And in Luke chapter 8, we'll see just one of the many times that what they saw, again, brought them to a point of decision. It's an amazing weather-related moment with Jesus in Luke. Okay, have you ever witnessed something truly remarkable and beyond human explanation. Hmm. I mean, if it happened in the Bible, we would call it a miracle, but today we just call it, boy, that's really something I don't have an explanation for. Yeah, I just recently saw a news story of four children that were in the Amazon for mm. like 40 days. Yeah. And they survived. Survived. Yeah. By themselves. I'm like, wow. And the youngest one was what, like 18 months or yes, something? Yes, and they kept the 18-month-old alive. I mean, when I was like 8 and 10 years old, I wouldn't have been <laughs> able to survive in a mall by myself <laughs> for 40 days. <laughs> they did it in a jungle. That's amazing. Yeah, it is. I remember a, a friend of mine, she's about 20 years older than me, and I've known her for now like 50 years, and her husband had a brain tumor. And was super serious. And, you know, they had him in the operating room all ready to go. And the surgeon began the process and the tumor was gone. Mm. I've known her my whole life just about. So to hear that, I mean, usually you're like, oh, yeah, well, probably the test was wrong or the, you know, MRI didn't get it or the CAT scan or whatever. But I know her better than that. And they were so dumbfounded. When I was pastoring, 
There's a young man in our church who went to South America for part of his summer on a missions trip. And they had the day off and went to some lake and he dove into the lake and broke his neck and came out of it paralyzed. Hmm. And his parents were just devastated. I mean, he's a good kid, a really good kid. And, um, you know, they said he'd never walk again. And I remember the day he walked into church. Mm. And there was just this gasp that went throughout the room because everybody knew the story and everybody knew what had happened to him. He was never supposed to be able to walk again. Hmm. He ended up marrying, having a family. I mean, restored. Mm -hmm. All the experts said that is no longer available to him, but that's what happened. Yeah, I'm reminded of my nephew who had emergency brain surgery a couple years ago now. And when they went in and found a softball-sized tumor in his little seven-year-old brain, it was a tumor that actually shows up in infants early on. And usually no kid that has that type of tumor makes it to even two years old. Wow. And this physician that's been doing this his whole career has Mm. never seen this particular tumor in a child that old who hadn't died. And so just the, like, they did surgery, pulled it out. He's doing really well, praise God. We thought he was going to die that weekend. But just the fact that he lasted that long to even get to the point of having surgery Mm -hmm. was a pretty big miracle. Yeah, we see miraculous things today. And like you said, at least oftentimes we try to find human explanations for those amazing things. But the God who worked miracles in the Bible is still capable of working Mm -hmm. miracles today. Mm -hmm. Uh, Psalm 71, 19 says, God is the one who has done great things. And I like to add on to that and still does Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. today. We're going to see another amazing moment in Luke in this one. And we said at the beginning that we want to focus on the people. And as we do, we see this rippling out relationally from Jesus. Jesus is the focal point. And so the first amazing moment we saw was his parents. Then it moved out to the people of his hometown. Now it moves out to his disciples. And so for that, we want to go to Luke chapter 8, and we want uh, verses 22 through 25. And uh, if y'all just want to share those and read around a little bit, let's get those in. Sure. I can start. One day, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. Hmm. The disciples went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. And he got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters, and the storm subsided, and all was calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? They were afraid and amazed, and said to one another, Who then is this, that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him? We kind of think that this happened around the midpoint of Jesus' public ministry, which means these guys have been with him for probably over a year now. This is not the first amazing thing they've seen by a long shot. And yet, not only were they amazed, how else does it describe them? Afraid and amazed. (laughs) They're afraid. I heard one teacher say one time that the only thing more fearful than a storm outside your boat is God in your boat. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And uh, they're experiencing God in their boat and trying to figure it out. So what, what about this story strikes you? I mean, the first thing that jumps out to me is Jesus seems to set this whole thing up in a way because he, he's the one that says, Hey, let's go to the other side of the lake. Yeah. And just knowing what we kind of know about Jesus in other places, he seems to have a, uh, shall we say foreknowledge of what might happen. (laughs) I mean, it could have said they were just out on a boat. And this happened, but instead the story starts with, let's go to the other side of the lake. And I think it's really good catch, Daniel, because Mm -hmm. there's so many of those details, like we saw in one of the earlier incidents we looked at. There are these really interesting little pieces of information that the authors insert in there for a reason, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And when it says Jesus initiated this, Mm -hmm. That's in there for a reason, and it may be for exactly what you said, because Jesus is preparing for this very moment. I always think of these action points as like lab 
experiences. You know how mm-hmm. in school you you have the lecture mm-hmm. and then you have the lab right, where yeah. you apply it. And you know he's got big old lectures going on with the parable of the sower and the lamp on the stand yeah. and you know all this teaching. Yeah. And then okay now, let's go get in the boat. You know, and by the way, I'm going to take a little break and go to sleep. Let's see how you begin to think about this in real life and how it changes who you are. Yeah. It's the deep sleep for me. Mm. Like to sleep in the midst of a storm. I'm like, Jesus, is, I, I can relate to that. Like I'm a heavy <laughs> sleeper too. And they're like, hey, what's going to like, w- yeah. wake up. We're, yeah. we're about to drown. But obviously that deep sleep also reflects a sense of peace with the situation Uh, To me, these disciples, a lot of them were fishermen who had spent their entire adult lives fishing on this lake. Mm. They knew how suddenly storm squalls could come across the Galilee, violent, violent storms. It's a fairly small lake. It's seven miles across and 12 miles long. But these guys are terrified by this storm. This isn't the first storm on the Galilee they've seen. Because this has been their entire life until they met Jesus. Doesn't that really show how intense this storm must have been, though? Because their response is, we're dying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, we're drowning. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. this was one of the storms that they must have seen and heard about others perishing on. And they knew, like, yep, this is is it. This is the one we knew was going to happen one day. But their response to the storm, other than being terrified by it, is to assume Jesus can do something about it. Hmm. Oh. Mm. Master, master, we're perishing. Fix it. I mean, you know, mm. what do you want me to do? Yeah. Uh, well, they don't even make the request of what they want him to do. They they just make him aware of the problem and leave the response and the result and the outcome to him. And he rebuked the wind and the surging waves and they stopped and it became calm. What do you think they thought he would do, Bill? That's a really pop for me. You know, master, master, we're going to drown because they are amazed. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I just immediately think that if you're trying to bail water, you uh, extra set of hands is helpful. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? I don't know yeah. if they, I don't think that that necessarily means that they thought he was going to fix it, uh-huh. cause, but just that he could, you know, help. help. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now we know that there are other times in the gospels where Jesus calms storms on the Galilee, right? And in one of those, they don't say to him, master, master, we're perishing. They say, master, master, don't you care mm-hmm. right. that we are perishing? Yeah. Which is, whew, boy, that's a hard thing. Don't you care? Mm-hmm. The very fact that Jesus is physically on planet earth is evidence of his care, right? So, his response to them is, where's your faith? Now, what do you think he's talking about there? I mean, reading between the lines, I think he senses their despair and doubt that he could do more than what they were maybe afraid of. Their fear had outstripped their faith mm. in what he could do. And is it, I'm going back to our first conversation, is it also, where is your faith in the ultimate journey that we're on you Mm. know that it's not just here that even if you do drown there is something more is it that kind of a perspective yeah and and even that word faith right means more of a trust than like coming to some mental acknowledgement that jesus could do something about it right which is what we typically think of as faith Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so is it where is your trust in me or where is your trust that i can do something about it or why aren't you leaning on me to fix it? Yeah, I think, you know, you take elements of all of those things and it may even be something as simple as the fact that after everything they had seen him do to this point, mm-hmm. why didn't they have confidence in him at this point? Mm-hmm. Um, for our last couple of minutes, just focus on that. They were fearful and amazed saying to one another, what? Who is this? Yeah. yeah. Who is this? What's the answer to that question? God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They were fearful and amazed. Who is this? Well, you've been with him for over a year. You ought to be starting to figure some things mm-hmm. out. I mean, it's easy for me to say that intellectually, but in my heart, I think I'd have been as slow-witted as those guys were. Especially because you'd be afraid for your life. Yeah. Right. And it does seem like even in the context of what they had in the Hebrew Bible, You look at Elijah for all that he did, but even he, when it came to drought, he could invoke God's presence, right? Like to bring fire down against the prophets of Baal, but it wasn't like it was him that was doing it. So even with Elijah, 
their understanding was that he could affect things by asking God. But in this case, Jesus just rebukes the wind himself, yeah. like yeah. without yeah. any assistance for right. appeal. Yeah. That's good. And that's like, whoa, yeah. wait yeah. a minute. Yeah. Like, yeah. this is different. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's yeah. like their response to his preaching. He speaks like someone who has authority. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, this is authority right here. So they're not seeing a vehicle. They're seeing the real thing. Yeah. Okay, let's draw this to a close with just one thing. In 825, he calms the wind and the waves, and they say, who is this? In the very next chapter, mm -hmm. we come to Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus turns the table and says, who do you say that I am? Mm -hmm. Now, there's been some other pretty amazing things happen. There's been demoniacs who've been released. There have been healing miracles. The 12, to your point, Daniel, have been sent out and come back. The 5,000 have been fed. They go to mm -hmm. Caesarea Philippi. Matthew tells us that's the location. And Jesus says, who do the people say that I am? And then he says, who do you say that I am? He's, in a sense, calling them to answer their own question. Mm. And who he's giving this? them a million other laboratory experiences yeah. to prove it and to verify what they saw. Who do you say that I am? I think is the ultimate decision point, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, we've seen this in all three of our conversations so far. People are being brought to a moment of decision. First, Simeon and the parents, then the hometown of Nazareth, now the disciples. We see these ripples continuing to enlarge, and it'll enlarge even further in our next conversation as we go to more of the faceless crowd. So far, we've seen the people who arguably knew Jesus best, his parents, his childhood neighbors, and his disciples, exhibiting amazement. And we've talked about this kind of concentric rippling out from him. And now we come to the watching crowds as the circle gets even broader and wider. And our last two conversations are both going to actually be the watching crowds who are amazed, and the events are not dissimilar. But let's look at Luke 9 and start with verse 37, and if y'all will just read around and get down to verse 43, that's where we pick up the amazement. Okay, I'll start. The next day, when they had come down from the mountain, so this is following the transfiguration, Correct. a large crowd met him. A man in the crowd called out, teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he's my only child. A spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams, and it throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely ever leaves him and is destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. Yeah, the word astonished is amazed. Yeah. Yeah, this is a very familiar story to us. And it's one that we've talked about on the program before. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, it's an unusual story in this sense. A lot of the times when we see these little episodes in Jesus's ministry, uh, Mark gives a briefer version than the other gospel records. But in this, Mark's account is much fuller hmm. and has a lot more detail. And Luke's account is actually quite brief in comparison. But let's start at the beginning of it. And it starts, as you rightly said, Elisa, the day after the transfiguration. So what was going on with the transfiguration? Well, speaking of small circles, only <laughs> a very small number of people yeah. experience that. And they're on a mountain where we've seen quite a few examples of Jesus's humanity and these hints at him being more than that, of being God. But on the mountain, it's kind of like the veil is pulled away and Correct. we see him as God and not just by himself, but he's got two really important people next to him with Elijah and Moses. Yeah, and Elijah's name kind of keeps popping up, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, we've seen Elijah's name in Luke 4 at Nazareth. 
it popped up again earlier in chapter 9 when Jesus says, who do the people say that I am? And some of the answers are Elijah. Mm -hmm. So Elijah kind of keeps showing up, which is kind of interesting in itself. So his majesty, if I can use that word, is revealed on the mountain. And Peter, James, and John are the only ones present with him. So the next day they come down from the mountain and they come down below and the rest of the disciples are down there and they're engaged in this verbal combat with some of the religious leaders. And it's interesting in Mark's gospel, Jesus comes and says, what are you arguing about? Once again, he kind of initiates the confrontation a little bit with them. But in Luke, all he tells us is there was a great multitude and the man cries out, help my son. Now, Mark gives us the detail that when Jesus said, what are you arguing about? The man says, I brought my son to your disciples to help him and they couldn't do it. So as Jesus steps into the situation, Jesus answered and said, oh, unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you and put up with you? Mm -hmm. Now, who's he talking to there? There's the disciples yeah. who could be, mm-hmm. be frustrated with because he just said it, it essentially commissioned them to do this very thing. Yeah. Those who they're arguing with who didn't even receive Jesus's authority, let alone ability to heal. And in fact, when he did heal, said he did it by the power of Satan. Yeah. And maybe, you know, the desperation of the father who, yeah. you know, is not quite sure that Jesus can do anything. Yeah. I'm struck by the word in 41, um, you unbelieving and perverse generation and Russell, you're translation said twisted generation. What does that mean exactly? Well, perverse and twisted, twisted is actually the literal definition of the word perverse. It's something that's misshapen or um, twisted, (laughs) you know. um, Out of sorts with uh, what the design was supposed to be. Yeah, out of shape from its intended design. So maybe just a reference to the faithlessness of the generation, the yeah. fact that they're not trusting in God ultimately and in Jesus. Mm-hmm. Now, Jesus heals the boy, which the disciples could, perhaps should have done, but didn't. Jesus does. Read again verse 43. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. Now, what hits you about that? Well, it says the greatness of God, not the greatness of Jesus, which is yeah. interesting. And they were all Amazed, which would seem to include the father, the son, the crowds, the disciples, the religious leaders, everybody. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good catch, Elisa. What I want to go back to is what Rasul said a minute ago when Jesus had healed some other demon possessed individuals. The religious leaders said he does it by the power of Satan. Mm -hmm. That's not the attribution here, is it? Mm -hmm. They're talking about the greatness of God Uh for this one shining moment. They get where Jesus's power comes from. And I think part of it is because it was so desperate and so dramatic. Mm -hmm. And so beyond the disciples' ability. Right, Mm -hmm. right. To see someone, and he wasn't there, right? He's up at the mountain. He comes down into a situation and- Welcome uh, to our world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Interestingly, as Daniel, as you were describing the events on the mountain, His glory and majesty were what were revealed Mm. on the mountain in an indisputable way for Peter, James, and John. Interestingly enough, the word greatness there, they were all amazed at the greatness of God. The word greatness means majesty. Mm. (laughs) So it was revealed in his unveiling on the mountain to Peter, James, and John, but it was revealed to the crowds in the rescue of this boy at the foot of the mountain. So this is their transfiguration in a way. Yeah. And that brings me back to that word of twisted or perverse. Jesus untwists Mm -hmm. what has been broken. Yeah. That's right. I think it's one of those events that, for me, is one of the hardest events in the Gospels to really sort out in my imagination, mostly because I don't have a lot of experience with demon-possessed people. I just don't. I mean... There's a lot of that demonic activity in the gospel records. I know I've read stories of missionaries who have encountered that kind of thing. And the demonic oppression and power that the forces of darkness can have over an individual's life are twisting. They they are twisting that person away from God's design and intent for them. And when you understand 
and I'm getting all of this secondhand from missionaries who've witnessed it. When you see the power of those forces of darkness, you realize only the greatness of God could break that hold that they have on that person. And little wonder that they were amazed at the greatness of God. Maybe the largest wonder is that in their amazement, they attributed that to Jesus, Mm. at least secondarily. Yeah, and I think about, though not as dramatic and miraculous as a child being oppressed by a demon, I think in a similar way, when people encounter the transformed lives of those of us who follow Jesus Mm -hmm. and see, I love what you said there, Daniel, about how he untwists. Mm -hmm. Yeah our lives, yeah. mm-hmm. it can also leave people with a totally. sense of, of amazement yeah, of that's right. an undeniable sense that something unique and miraculous has happened. And maybe the closest thing I would have to compare that, what you're saying to Russell, would be somebody who had spent years as an alcoholic or addicted to drugs or things of that nature, and then to see them liberated by the power of Christ as they put their faith in him. It is amazing. (laughs) And once again, it's a reminder in our generation that we might not see the exact replica of what Jesus did in John 9, but we see similar things reminding us that God still does amazing things in our day and in our time as well. And that's one of the things we hope our conversations about amazing moments in Luke accomplish. Looking at these people who were amazed at what Jesus said and did will prod us to think about the amazing moments we've had in our walk with the Lord. Because in reality, we all have them. Because as Bill said, God is still doing amazing things in our day and in our time as well. Well, Bill said that our last amazing moment in Luke involved a crowd of onlookers as well. And so what did they see Jesus do that was so collectively jaw-dropping and amazing? Well, that's what we'll discover after we peek ahead of what we have planned for the next episode of the Discover the Word podcast. Dr. Tim Laniak spent the good part of a year with Bedouin shepherds in the Middle East and discovered why shepherding is such a great image used in so many ways in Scripture. I had another amazing encounter with a Bedouin who I interviewed more than once because he was just so good. And I brought my son, who was only 12. (laughs) I said, you know, what does it take to be a good shepherd? And he said, you gotta have a heart for it. If you don't have the heart for it, don't be in it. So then he said, you know, my sons don't have the heart for it because they think it's just a business. Mm -hmm. Then he said, your son, Jesse, he looks like he has the heart for it. Why don't you tell him if he wants to stay, I'll give him 200 head of sheep to start. I'll give him a Jordanian education, and I'll give him a wife. So I said, you know, well, maybe Jesse needs some time to think about (laughs) it, but just the perception that this is not about skills. Mm. This guy literally said, if you have the heart for it, you can start on Monday. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Mm. If you don't have the heart for it, then go somewhere else. That's fascinating. It's just not going to be it. Yeah, don't miss this great conversation with Tim Laniak called The Good Shepherd on the next Discover the Word podcast. And now, let's listen as Bill and Elisa and Daniel and Rasul do a quick review of the first four times where Luke said certain people were amazed by something Jesus said or did. And then they'll add the fifth instance before wrapping up with what kinds of things we can take away from our focus on these amazing moments in Luke. We've been focusing on who is actually amazed Mm -hmm. more so than on the the events themselves. So who have we seen so far that's been amazed? First, we saw Mary and Joseph were amazed as they presented Jesus as a baby at the temple. And Simeon responded with a prophetic utterance over him. That's good. Then we saw the people of Nazareth, where he grew up, amazed that he uh, understood and could break down scripture and announce himself in such an authoritative way. And then offend them. <laughs> and then offend them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then the disciples on a boat, a storm comes up, and many of them would have seen storms like this before, and yet something about this storm makes them think they're going to die. Jesus is asleep, so they wake Jesus up, and 
tell him, hey, aren't you going to do something about this? And Jesus rebukes the wind and waves. Mm -hmm. And it says that, and then it was calm. Yeah. And they're afraid. They weren't. Yeah. The storm was calm, but they weren't. <laughs> yeah. And it said they were afraid and amazed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. asked the question, who is this that mm-hmm. can do this? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then a chapter later, Jesus says, who do you say that I am? Which I find ironic. In our last conversation, we had our first contact with the crowds. We've seen this rippling going out and including larger and larger groups. And we're going to see the crowds again in this one. We're going to be in Luke chapter 11. But before we go there, just a little side note for our friends at the table with us. Something to look for when you read the Gospel of Luke. When we come to Luke's Gospel, the defining characteristic of Luke's Gospel actually comes in Luke 9.51. Somebody read Luke 9.51 for us. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Yeah, this launches what scholars call Jesus's journey to Jerusalem. And starting in Luke 9:51, everything that Luke packs into this part is preparation for what's going to happen when he gets to Jerusalem. And that will come in Luke 19 at the triumphal entry. So not all of the gospel writers are equally interested in the actual chronology of the Mm -hmm. events uh, in which they take place. And Luke uses some literary license under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to give us things within this journey to Jerusalem to help prepare the reader for what's going to happen there, which is ultimately going to be the cross and resurrection. And then, as you read, Elisa, his ascension which is the ultimate conclusion of his earthly journey. So with that in mind, we're now just launching into this journey to Jerusalem, and we come to chapter 11. And I would like for one of you, if you would, to read verse 14. I can. Now he was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the one who had been mute spoke, and the crowds were amazed. Hmm. Now, in our last conversation, we saw Jesus dealing with a demon-possessed boy. Now it's a a demon-possessed man. I I love the way Luke does this. I mean, this is like you're watching TV and you change channels in the middle of a program and you leave that program and you drop into the middle of another program in the middle of something else that's going on. You almost get that sense with this. He starts off, and he was casting out a demon. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. You know, <laughs> no what, big deal. Right? Yeah, what, what happened before this? What, what led up to this? It's interesting. In Matthew 12, in Matthew's account of this event, he tells us the man was also blind. Mm. One of the many blind people that Jesus encountered. But he cast the demon out. It was a demon that was making the man unable to speak. And when the demon was gone, the man started talking. Mm. And the multitudes were amazed. The crowds were amazed at this, which tells me a couple of things. One of the things it tells me is they knew this guy and that this had been a longstanding problem that he had had because this wasn't just a sleight of hand deal that Jesus did. This was a true miraculous healing that untwisted something that the evil one had twisted. And it just reminds me of how small community life was in so Mm -hmm. many of these small villages that Jesus is walking through everyone knows everybody they've grown up together they know each other's lives they share the synagogue together there's just this knowing this rootedness that they have that when something like this happens they realize how big of a deal it is it's not like some group of people are following jesus through areas they don't know it's they're in their homes <laughs> yeah. they're in their spaces and so when something like this happens it's like we've known this guy a long time we know he can't speak and now he's speaking what is going on here yeah that's good that's a great perspective daniel and i can feel the way you're describing it almost like we take it for granted and mm-hmm. get used to that and jesus comes in and disrupts that so wildly yeah, yeah. or for me too it's also like and i'm just used to seeing magicians show up in big cities mm-hmm. and do some kind of sleight of hand but at the same time you're like okay there's something i just didn't see yeah. all right or something yeah, oh, you got, so you doubt it. right whereas when you're talking about someone who they've grown up around this guy that can't mm-hmm. speak It's huge. And then all of a sudden he can speak. There's no like, oh, you know, they brought in somebody that 
is a really good actor or mm-hmm. something. They knew mm-hmm. that this was the real deal. Yeah. In a sense, the way you're describing it, Daniel, reminds me of when you led us through John 9 and 10. And in John yeah. 9, after Jesus heals the man who was born blind, mm-hmm. the first people to react are his neighbors. Yeah. The people who had known him apparently his entire life. And if you've known this guy his entire life, you have to believe either he's the best at faking blindness of anybody who's ever lived or else something truly amazing has just happened. And the thing that really sticks out to me is the multiple reactions and responses to the same event. Yeah. Um, Hmm. We see some, it says they were amazed. But then it says in verse 15, but some of them said, no wonder he can cast out demons. He gets his power from Satan, the prince of demons, Yeah, which is another wild mm-hmm. uh, accusation. Wonder how genuine or non that is. And then 16, others mm-hmm. trying to test Jesus demanded that he showed them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. <laughs> it's like, yeah, were you not paying attention? You're right. I just healed just someone. Just did it. Mm-hmm. And, and that, I think, also is a reflection of, of even though we live in different times where we're not used to seeing these things, I think in our hearts, there can still be the same type of various responses to Jesus Mm -hmm. that can still say, I want to see more, Mm -hmm. show me something else. Yeah, the cynicism and the skepticism and all that. that Or even the polite response of, well, he was a good man or he was a good teacher, he was a good moral example, which in their own way are just as dangerous as the Mm -hmm. direct opposition statements. One of the things that I find really intriguing about this event, and we didn't do anything to set up the context because it just seems like we just switched the channel on the remote <laughs> and we land in the middle of this. Yes. Week, and he was casting out a demon. Okay, well, Luke tells us leading up to this, Jesus was teaching about something very specific. What's going on in the earlier verses? He's teaching on prayer. And I was actually looking at that while we were talking and just the tenderness of what the father really wants for his children and the Mm -hmm. faithfulness we can approach him with. Yeah, I think that's really good, Elisa. And again, all of the things that Jesus is saying about prayer are some of those things that speak into God's desire to untwist us. Yeah, yeah. To untwist us Mm -hmm. and, and restore us and make us whole. The other thing that's interesting about this, in our last conversation, we talked about the demon possessed boy Jesus coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration and healing him after the disciples couldn't. What's really interesting is in that event in Mark's gospel, after it's all said and done, the disciples come to Jesus and say, why weren't we able to do this? And Jesus says, this kind does not go out except with much prayer. Prayer. (laughs) And you see the same connection here. Jesus teaches on prayer. And then immediately Luke throws us into the middle of this event where Jesus is doing something that is very much prayer activated. I think it's a good reminder to us, you know, in all those times we try to figure it out, like the disciples must have been trying to do with that boy. And when they failed, Jesus said, yeah, that's because you were trying to figure it out. This kind comes out through prayer. Helping us connect those dots from our impotence to God's power is really, really a dramatic turn in Luke because he doesn't make the connection the same way Mark does, but the connection's there. So it sounds like what you're saying, Bill, is that it's great for us and we ought to sit with and be amazed by the miraculous power of Jesus throughout the Gospels. But that's not the end of the story. There's also an action point for us, just like it was with the disciples, Mm -hmm. that we ought to position ourselves to, through prayer, participate in his miraculous works in the world. Yeah, to the degree he equips us to do that. I mean, you know, we we can't predetermine, or, yeah. uh, predetermine how God is going to choose to accomplish his work. But even if our participation is just through prayer. Well, he goes on to right after this situation and talks about a divided kingdom. And, yeah. you know, it, to me, that's also like an invitation to do our part, yeah. the way you're describing this. You know, we can either be on his side or we can be divisive and pulling against, you know, what his intentions are. So, yeah, there, I see an invitation in here, too. Yeah, there's a sense in which doing nothing mm-hmm. is doing something mm-hmm. all by itself. But the call to prayer is such a dramatic thing for us to see because we know that even though the Son of God himself 
with this kind of power at his disposal, how many critical moments in his ministry did he step away by himself to pray before he engaged in that moment? And we've all heard this, we've all taught this, we all know this, but we also all need to be reminded of this, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that if Jesus himself, God in human flesh, was that dependent upon prayer, how much more are we as we try to engage our world and the twistedness that we see all around us? Yeah, and it reminds us of who we're praying to, Yeah, which is the verse right before this, that we are praying to a heavenly father who, you know, we as earthly parents still want good for our kids, even though we're broken and do bad things and hurt our kids sometimes just as much as we help them. But our heavenly father, who's perfect, who always does what's best, he's the one that we're praying to. And he knows what's best for us. And he may not answer our prayers the way that we want or the way that we think is best, but he'll answer them in the way that's truly best for for the world, for ourselves, and for his glory, which was pretty amazing in this story. So amazing moments in Luke that just keeps unfolding, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And if I could challenge us around the table and those who have come and joined us here at the table, allow God to reignite your sense of wonder Mm -hmm. at who Jesus is and at who our God is and at what he can do. I think we just need to be amazed at who he is and uh, let that be core to our relationship with him. And so with that, we wrap up this study of amazing moments in Luke. Some pretty amazing moments, to be sure. And I hope your sense of wonder has been reignited by our conversations and that you'll spend some time reflecting on not only the amazing moments that we read about in Scripture, but the amazing moments you've had with Jesus as well. Thanks again for joining Bill Crowder, Daniel Ryan Day, Elisa Morgan, and Rasul Berry as we were reminded just how amazing it is to know Jesus in this episode of the Discover the Word podcast. Discover the Word is a Bible engagement resource from Our Daily Bread Ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ and always point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. Well, thanks for listening. I'm Brian Henning. Don't miss our next podcast with our guest, Dr. Tim Laniak, as he provides some fascinating insights into shepherds and shepherding and why the image of the Good Shepherd is so meaningful. Discover the Word is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministries.